This message was recorded at the Billy Graham Training Center at The Cove in Asheville, North Carolina. Through the ministry of The Cove, we're training people in God's Word to win others to Christ. It's our goal to develop Christians who experience God through knowing Him better, knowing His Word, building godly relationships, and helping others know Him. We trust that this message will strengthen your walk with God and help you experience Him right where you are. You could have been one of the millions of people who've seen the Shroud of Turin. You could have waited in line in Turin, Italy, for up to eight hours. And when you get in, you see this, that's not even this good looking. Sideways in a bulletproof case with glass, a bullet and burn proof case because it's been in two fires. And there's glass on the front of it, so there's glare. And you go... <laughs> I waited for eight hours for this. There's glare, it's sideways, and I don't even see an image. Oh, I see some funny things. Well, let me find the funny things. Down the two edges are a series of burn marks, almost like, almost like uh, paper, paper doll cutouts. When the shroud was in a fire, I won't use it, the, uh, the pointer taught I really have to use it. I think you folks can can um, see here. Well, maybe you can't see. Okay. What you're looking at, do you see the face in the middle of the screen? Okay. Above the face looks like another round thing above. That's the back of the head. The shroud was wrapped around the body this way, so that when it's open, the body would fall out, theoretically. But it's looped around the head. What you see up at the top is the bloody back of the head. The face is in the middle. But it looks like some kind of psychological Rorschach test or something. Like, you know, if I tell you enough about this, will you start seeing what I tell you? You know. And you say, this isn't worth staying in line. But you take pictures. I stood this long. I'm going to take pictures, and you do. And when you develop the pictures, that's what you see. In 1898, they saw this for the first time. An Italian photographer named Secunda Pia, he went the old days, you know where they used the plates? Like the gunslinger, where they use famous gunslingers, and they're taken there. All right, he put his plates, and he's developing these plates, and all of a sudden, that picture was staring at him. Now, this is the two side by side. On the right is the way the shroud image looks to the naked eye. The left is what the photograph looks like. Now, notice some funny things. There's light darkness reversal, and there's left right reversal. These are not normal. They're not impossible, but they're not normal. See on the right, the one that, to the naked eye. Notice the number three shaped blood stain on the forehead. Okay, now look at the one on the left. The three stain is backwards. Also notice that the dark spots, spots on the right, like on the cheeks, the mustache, the beard, are dark. Flip across, and they're all light. So you have a left-right light, light darkness reversal. And in 1898, this was one of the first signs that this might be a little bit different, but he wasn't sure what it was. And he kept taking photos, and here's a few others. This puts the picture side by side. On your left is the natural one, only the face is going up, and you're seeing the back of the head down to the ankles. On the right is the photo. The other thing the shroud does is, remember the three stain, it, it reverses. So on the right, the face is in the lower picture, and the left, the face is in the upper picture. So. Photographs show something goofy going on, and, and whatever created this image seems to be a mystery. That's where they started. All right, let's go to some other things, and we'll come back to this. This is the way, this is probably the best picture that shows you how the man of the shroud was buried. This is um, a 16th century painting, and you see the picture of the man in the shroud, hands crossed in front, uh, Shroud down the length of the body. Notice how it loops around the head. That's what you saw with the basically two heads, front and back. And up above, the angels are holding the shroud. And even back then, there was an image on it. 
See, they're holding it up, and there's an image on it. I was lecturing at Christ Church, Oxford, in um, 1988, and I had published my first book on the Shroud in 1981 with Ken Stevenson, who was the editor and spokesman for the team of scientists who were in, had been in Italy. And we were all waiting for the carbon-14 because every other evidence on the shroud seems like the shroud is authentic. And right while I'm uh, speaking at Christ Church, someone said, whoa, did you hear the news? What's that? The shrouds are fake. What? The shrouds are fake. Well, we had a day trip that day into, into London. And when we got to London... The newspaper piles were like this high, and they're selling papers. And the front paper, front page, the Shroud of Turin is a fake. The carbon dating came in. They averaged the dates, and the Shroud was dated between 1260 and 1390 A.D. And everyone's going, they're either saying, yeah, I thought it was a fake. That's the way these things all go. These Catholic relics. Well, you know the funny thing about that? It wasn't even a Catholic relic. It's been held in the, in the Catholic Church and cathedrals, but it was owned by an exiled king of Portugal and his family. Now, he bequeathed it to the Catholic Church later. But when people were saying, uh, it's one of those Catholic relics, it wasn't. So, um, okay, but here's what happened to the 88 dating. Over the years since 1988, everything else looks good. As you're going to see, there's a lot of evidences that are very impressive. And the lone standout, more or less, is... This thing looks like uh, medieval, like around 1300. Like I said, between um, 1260 and 1390. Well, here's three responses. One was the chief chemist on the team, who is um, uh, his name was uh, Rogers, last name, right there, right there, Ray Rogers, and. He published an article, Thermo, Thermochemica Acta is a secular peer-reviewed chemical journal, secular. And he published this article, and it said you could prove that what they dated were post-shroud pieces. Now, let me explain that. When the shroud got caught in a fire prior to the 16th century painting, obviously because there's image there, and the burn marks are on it, if you saw it, the burn marks are on the painting, um, it was already been in a fire. And so well-meaning nuns, let me back up. Do you see the picture on the left there? Do you see the, the little white triangles up and down the shroud that are on top of the burn marks? Those are patches. They were added to the shroud by nuns. Uh, we've been talking about the N-O-N-E-S. This is the N-U-N-S. And they added them to kind of fix up the, the image. And... There's two kinds of patches on the shroud, just like we have two kinds of patches today. Let's take a scenario. Uh, Mom tells her son, when you get home from church, change your pants before you play baseball. And one day, the son runs out without thinking, comes home, and his knees torn out of his his best pants. Mom has a couple choices. Get those iron-on patches, and now his best pants are his play pants. Or... If it's a small tear, she does what is called, technically, is called an invisible weave, but you all know what it is. She tries to match the thread to the pants color, and she tries to sew it in so that it doesn't look like there's any tear there. Or you take it to a seamstress to do it. There are both kinds on the shroud, patches and the small sewing. And Ray Rogers, back to him, Ray Rogers argued that they, da- they dated shroud extras and not the original. You go, well, that's convenient if you want to believe in the shroud. First of all, this article, Rogers is not trying to back up anything Christian. In fact, he starts this article and he says, we're not talking about miracles of this thing. I hate miracles talk. We're not even going to consider it. I'm sick of miracles talk. I'm just talking about an archaeological artifact here. Now that I got that out of the way, let me move on. And he says that there were still pieces of the shroud hanging around. And Rogers took those pieces and he had them tested. And I'm not a chemist by a long shot, but the the, the one of them that he said were 
checked out to be the patches, were different chemically than the shroud pieces. They were different. And you could, um, you could tell. I mean, he, he, first of all, he's not religious in that sense, doesn't care if it's a miracle, uh, doesn't even want to talk about it. But he says, the, he said, I'm just giving you a chemical art- argument. These two cloths have different chemicals. One, if you're, if you're into this kind of thing, um, the, your engineers here or others, one of them fluoresces and one of them does not fluoresce. So that and some other things in the chemical makeup under electron microscope, he says, look, it's just simple science. These two cloths are not the same. And you guys dated the bad ones. So it still could be medieval, but your dates are no good because you, you did the wrong thing. Here's an excerpt from this secular chemical journal. In 1988, they narrowed this down to 1260 and 1390 with a 95% chance of confidence. Prompted questions. Look at the red. That's my red, not the article. The observations prove that the radiocarbon sample was not part of the original cloth of the Shroud of Turin. The radiocarbon date was thus not valid for determining the true age of the Shroud. The Shroud could still be that date, but not because of your tests. Your tests are invalid. And this was published in that journal. Okay. Very recently, a whole nother argument has come out. Uh, Roger's argument was pretty authoritative. A lot of people liked it. This one has gotten everybody's attention. In fact, there were four authors in this one. The first author, Tristan Casabianca. Um, We had him at Liberty. He came to speak at the Bible Museum in D.C. And we got him to get on a, uh, I don't know what it was, a bus or something. And he came... And we had him here to talk to our, speak to our students at Liberty. And what he did was he had an inkling something was wrong. So on his four-person team, he has a textile expert, two uh, people with PhDs in statistics, and then his own work. And they had to uh, apply to the International Freedom of Information Act. It took them two years to get the data. But they got all the dates from the three... Uh, labs, one in Switzerland, one was either Arizona or Arizona State, and the third one was Oxford University. And they got all the dates, and they found out how they got that date of 1988. They averaged the dates. And the statistician says it's the stupidest thing in the world. You don't take a bunch of dates and average them. There are laws and statistics. And they said again, like Rogers, we don't know what the date the shroud is. But your dates are all over the place. You've got them, the dates are seven centuries apart. And so you can't just average them and say, therefore, it's right in the middle. So what they did was they took it to an Oxford journal, archaeochemistry, and I have to check this one, uh, archaeometry. And if I got this right, the guy who's editing that journal today is one of the three guys in Oxford who printed the original conclusion in 1988. And he thought this, this comeback was good enough to print it in his journal. So he printed the 1988 one, and he prints the, the one here. And again, this, this one is really stuck. And people are saying, yeah, we got to date this thing all over again, but the date we got was, was no good. And here's a third answer to it. In a way, this one's the most impressive because you don't have to do what a lot of people don't understand uh, by way of science. But it's an art history argument. Now, that sounds kind of non-empirical to me, but watch what they do with it. There are a lot of pictures of Jesus that are patterned after the man in the shroud. Now, there's no way I'm going to say they thought they were painting Jesus, therefore they were painting Jesus. But a lot of people thought they were. And these, these pieces of art are spread all away. In fact, well, let, let's talk about the, this one here before I flip to the next one. There's some real strange things between what they thought they were painting and, or using other kind of artwork, and the shroud. For example, in between the, the, the eyebrows of the man in the shroud on the left, there's a, probably a blood stain, but it looks triangular. You see that? It's a triangular mark between the eyes. It points down toward the nose. Um, I don't know if this will work or not, but is everybody seeing it okay without? Right 
there. Okay, good. Um, so look what he does in the painting. He paints a triangle between Jesus' eyes. It's like, silly. Why triangle between his eyes? Well, that's Jesus, right? I don't know. What are you doing? I'm painting him. That's Jesus. He got a triangle. I put a triangle there. All right, great. All right. The hair of the man of the shroud goes behind the right side and down on the shoulder, but the left, the, the, the right side here, his right side, um, and the left one, it, not in the painting, but in the original, the left side is out a bit, the right side goes behind. He paints it that way, the painting. All right. In the face, it looks like the beard is about as short as mine. You all see that? It looks like it ends right here. That beard goes down to here. You see the not the thick line underneath the under beard on the left side, but you see the line down at the very bottom? That's the beard, how far it goes. Why does the guy in the right paint the beard short? Because he thinks it where is where the, the blood wound is, and he's just wrong. That's not where the beard goes. But he's got a short beard. And the, but he's got a problem. He has a short beard, but there's a line down there in the cloth where the beard ends. So if you look closely... He puts a line across Jesus' throat down here when he thinks the beard ends here. Why? Because the shroud has a line. I don't mean that dark line. That's a blood That's a blood stain, and it's original because it's in the linen, and it's just a rivulet that goes through a crease in the linen. But the one below, that light black one, look what he does with the throat. You're going to see this better as we go on. But they paint some mark, barrier, whatever, against the neck. Uh, that one's probably my favorite one. Why do you put a mark against Jesus' bare skin and the neck? Why the triangle between the eyes? Why the short beard? Oh, what also in the, the shroud painting on the left? Notice that the if that was a beard, notice the little peak in the middle? It's off center. Do you notice that? It's off center. Look what he does in the painting. He's got it off center. He's got a triangle. He got the hair locks the same way. The beard is off center. He puts a short beard because he thinks that's, he's looking at a blood stain. It's not the rest of it. They can tell when they do uh, all these electronic, I mean, all these, uh, every non destructive test you can do on the shroud. You'll see pictures. And then down below, there's that line there, and he puts it across the neck. Now, this painting is about the 10th century, something like that. Here's the problem 10th century is way before the 13th century. So, so I, I don't care if the picture's Jesus, but the guy painting thought it was Jesus, and it's not 1288. See, it's three centuries off. Okay, wait till you see this one. This is the famous Panda Crater, uh, which is in the, uh, what's the name of the chapel there? It's underneath Jerusalem, down in the desert, the famous monastery. Anybody know? That's where this thing is. You know, the Christian sites were plundered by Muslims in the Middle Ages. They left this site alone. And that famous painting, it's not really a painting, it's like a wax relief or something. But let's look at a few things. This thing, well, let me tell you the similarities first. Hair parted down the middle, same way. Behind, hair behind on the right, same way. Out on the left, same way. Beard looks short, doesn't have the, doesn't have the peak in the middle, but it, it's short. He puts that line across the neck down there. He's, you can't see it. The painting is real light. Uh, the wax thing is real light. But he's got a triangle between the eyes. I mean, he just he's right on here with the triangle and the line and a short beard, and they're all wrong. But he thinks he's got the right thing. You know when this thing was, how this far this goes back? Sixth century BC, 500s. Now, how much difference is there between 500 and 1288? Something's wrong with the carbon-14, for sure. Not, it's irrelevant whether the painting is Jesus. It's irrelevant whether he thought his painting Jesus. It's irrelevant whether the shroud is painted, whether, whether it's Jesus or not. It's all irrelevant. But whatever the shroud is, it was known many centuries before the 1288 date. That's what this shows. The art argument is people knew this thing, whatever it was, way, way, way before 1288. All right, now that gets even better now. These are gold coins from the Roman Empire. They actually had little gold coins, smaller than our dimes, and they're different 
denominations, like it might be a, the equivalent of a nickel and a dime, you know. And they're gold coins. And let's go on the upper left. That's Jesus. Behind him is a cross. You see that? The, he's alive and everything, but the, uh, just a reminder, this is Jesus. And one of the scientists have developed a limit, a, a, a image overlay for photographs. And they can tell how many similarities are there are on this coin, and the others like it. There's a bunch of them. Uh, the guy, by the way, I know the guy who did the testing. He went out and found these things. He bought actual, the actual gold coins from the Roman Empire. They're expensive, and you've got to track them down, but they're available. And he got them. So what he did with the overlay, he took the gold coin from the upper left. Down at the bottom is the shroud, but he made it a different color. He you know, put a light behind it or something. Just to make the shroud, to be fair, you want them both to have a gold tone to them. And the one on the right is the shroud face being laid over the coin face. And what they report, don't know how accurate this is. Somebody will be a detective in here and tell me they, they rejected this a long time ago. But the rule when this was coming out was that 40 points of similarity or identical, I guess it would have to be more identical than similarity. If you, um, I'll make it you instead of me. If you rob a 7-Eleven and they get your picture up there and nobody knows who you are, but they have a high school picture of you, but now you're in your 20s, they can compare the pictures and if they have 40 points, you're going to trial, or at least theoretically. Um, there are, depends on which gold coin you're talking about, there are between 150 and 200 points of similarity between the Roman coins and the shroud face. You know where these coins are dated? The late 600s, about 695 to about 715. Way before the 500 date. So you have the wax picture. You have the coins there's a lot of people who think this is Jesus. They use the shroud as an image, and the shroud's been around for a long time. So forget that carbon dating. We don't know how old the, old, we don't know how old the shroud is, but you'll have to make a decision based on other things here. So this coin argument is very impressive. So all these art type, you know, the artwork, the wax, so on. All right, let's keep going. Other considerations. I told you that virtually every consideration but that medieval date is pro-shroud. This is the right eye of the man of the shroud. They did all kinds of image enhancement. We have a lot, even back in 78, there was a lot of ID type stuff. And you know, the first researchers were the Air Force Academy of Scientists in Colorado Springs. My co-author, Ken Stevenson, was in a carpool with four of them. And today it's a very famous carpool. Uh, the carpool had a typical cross-section of Americans, had two Catholics. Uh, my co-author, Ken, was a Catholic, but he'd become a Baptist, and there was an agnostic in there. Okay, now if I don't tell you this story, remind me to tell you about the agnostic who was in the car. But they're in a carpool, and they're going to check, check these things out. Over the right eye of the man in the shroud, let's first look at a, a leptin, a Roman leptin, with a staff there and some lettering on it. Here's a leptin again on the left, and on the right is the right eye of the man of the shroud. Now, I, I grant, only scientists are divided on how good an argument this is, but it looks like that could be a staff. Okay, you all see that, that part? That's like the foggy part to me. Um, right here, that could be a staff, may not be. Could be, maybe not. Here's what I'm interested in. These four letters, UCI in Greek, they're up to seven letters now. Guess what that is? Tiberius Caesar. This is a leptin of Pontius Pilate. And that's his name. UCI, part of... Tiberius Caesar. And there's a misspelling in Tiberius Caesar's name. The name's misspelled. Well, back in the days when a, Josh McDowell and I were quite good friends, but back in the days when we hardly knew each other, 
Um, Ken and I published our first book in 81, and like 82 or 83, Josh published an article. He said the shroud was a bunch of baloney. And one of the things he said was, he said, who would strike a coin with their own emperor name misspelled? And some people said, the Jews who hated his guts anyway and wish he wasn't around. Well, guess what? Ultimate refutation. They have found seven leptons of Pontius Pilate now with the misspelling of Tiberius' name. Oh, no. This is getting way too close. So next time I saw Josh, I said, hey, dude, you want to, you want to debate this thing? He goes, no, I'll let you go on that one. <laughs> but he already published the article that they must have been drunk. Okay, maybe they, a, maybe they were drunk. But What is a leptin? Sorry? What is a leptin? I don't know what it is. It's like the widow's mite. Okay, I'll give you another one, just another argument. But so far, we've got the date is wrong. They've been painting this picture for many years. Um, there's the, uh, this coin. Now, I did not bring my slide. They've also found pollen on the shroud. It's not been out of Italy or France in its modern history since the late Middle Ages. Not been out of Italy or France, but there's pollen on it from the Middle East. And these pollens are prehistoric, meaning they don't exist anymore alive. And several of these pollens are found only in the area of Jerusalem and the Dead Sea. Mystery goes on. Now, I like this painting because to me it typifies the beginning of the scientific investigation. There are about 35 American scientists. They're gathered together in the cathedral at Turin. That's John Jackson on the, on the chair. Uh, John is probably the most, he's got to be one of the two, one or two most authoritative scholars on the shroud. He was a professor of theoretical physics at the Air Force Academy, PhD in physical, um, I mean, in, in theoretical physics. He's going over, and one of the guys in the carpool, He's going over last-minute instructions of, y'all be here, we don't have any time. When this guy's done, you get in and start taking your ultraviolet photos. When the ultraviolet photos are gone, we need the infrared photos. And they're going to start investigating these things later, but they need the photos first. They took thousands and thousands of photos. Okay, so he's, he's just giving the directions. John Jackson's in the background there. He's the white shirt with the check. That shirt looks like a pretty recent shirt. This is uh, 78. That's Eric Jumper in the foreground. If you could see closer, his name tag is there, Eric Jumper. He was a professor in one of the mechanical engineering type fields at the Air Force Academy. And for the first time in history, the, there's a backing on the shroud. They're taking the backing off and they're trying to answer the question, does the image go on the back of the cloth? Because that'll help them chemically to tell what's going on. Is the image on the back of the cloth or is it only in the front? And here's the amazing, look at the look on John's face behind. See, it's like, like he's looking, a, look, looking at a spy movie or something. And, and um, here's, the, here's the answer. The blood stains are contact images. They're from touching the body, and the blood goes through the cloth. Duh. It's a, it's a, the, the cloth is um, uh, a little over 14 feet long, three and a half feet wide, but it's a, it's a linen. It's like a piece of, it's like a sheet. And if you're bleeding, you get blood on the sheet. The blood goes all the way through. The image does not. Now, it's really significant because the image is on the top. If you take a fiber and you blow the fiber up so it's like this, it's a thread, and you blow it up that big, the thread could be made up of approximately, estimated, approximately 200 fibrils. The image is on the top one maybe two fibrils. It doesn't go on the back of the thread, let alone on the back of the cloth. There's, the image is not there. So now they're adding these odd things. That, that is called superficiality. Almost every means we know of putting, I don't mean photographs, but putting real substance on cloth is going to make marks on the back. Powder will even sift through. Paint will definitely sift through, dye. So one of the earliest decisions of the shroud is there's no paint, dye, powder, or any foreign substance on the shroud that, can, that could create this image. Now, if someone will tell you, oh, there's, there's paint all over it, that's true. A lot of people have painted it. There's specks, 
and they go all over. They're in the image up in the corner. They're in that image area because painters are, you know, doing this stuff and the stuff's flinging all over. But notice what I said. There's no paint, dye, or powder in the image area which can account for the image. There's nowhere near for the image, and it's superficial. The guy in the far left, he's passed away now, but that's Vern Miller. He was a Mormon. A nice, um, uh, again, an example of a cross-section of America. He was the one of two lead photo- scientific photographers. He was a professor at the Brooks Institute of Photography in California. I don't know anything about that stuff, but it was called the second most prestigious uh, photography school. They got some good people. The third person, I mean, the other, the other um, chief photographer was Barry Schwartz. What's interesting about Barry, we've become very good friends. And the neat thing about Barry is he's an Orthodox Jew, non-Christian. And as early as 82, he started doing some, when they got the results back, which I haven't told you yet, but I'll tell you ahead of time, Barry started saying, why is everybody mad at me? I'm Jewish, and I'm sure this is the burial ground with Jesus. Now, I don't think it's a resurrection. I hope they find a way. I don't believe in the resurrection, but this is Jesus. Why are you getting mad at me for saying Jesus is on the shroud? shroud. Jesus was a Jew last time I checked, and he's saying things like that to the press. He's a really funny guy. Um, he's, he's like a hippie. I even said to him once, dude, you're, you're still like a hippie. And he goes, I am. I'm just the same way. But he goes off on people who just judge and they have no idea of the science. And these two are scientific photographers. The f- guy in the far right with the white lab coat is an Italian scientist who was present. All right. I like this picture too. Uh, can you tell we're in the 70s? You like that flower power shirt? I used to have some like that. I don't know if any of you do. We gave them away when they got outdated. This is Sam Pellicori from the Jet Propulsion Lab. He's a physicist. But, I mean, I guess they don't have any hair rules here. They're at the academy. He's got a long beard and got long hair. And I like that shirt. I wouldn't wear it, but it looks nice. And if you know where he's looking on the cloth, if you're used to looking at it, he's looking with an electron microscope. He's doing some very careful work. He's a physicist. He's looking at the face. How do you know? Maybe some of you are way ahead. Can you see my thing? Okay. Here's the hands crossed in front. This is the upper part of the body. So he's checking out. That's a pretty good look at the burn marks and the patches there. But he's he's studying um, whatever it is, whatever part of the face. And uh, I like that picture because you know why else I like it? Sam's one of the agnostics on the team. He was not the guy in the carpool. Those two are two, that makes two agnostics on the team. And Sam's interested as, a, as, a, as an archaeological artifact. The shroud has more man hours devoted to it than any archaeological artifact in history. Pyramids, anything. More has been done on the shroud than anything. All right, let's add to the mysteries. Besides those paintings, we talked about the coins in the eyes. I told you about not having the photographs of the pollen here, but they go back to Palestine, but this stuff is in Western Europe. Here's the next one. Kodak made a special contact tape that could be used for it to lift samples off the shroud, and, and this guy, this scientist, is getting samples off the feet of the man in the shroud, taking samples. There's dirt in the feet, duh. There's dirt in the feet. Guess what the dirt is? Limestone. Okay, this was, this was also published in a peer-reviewed chemical journal. This study, I'm going to tell you. Guess where the limestone's from? It's a rare species of limestone found almost exclusively in Jerusalem. Now look, if you're a medieval faker, why do you want a, a pile of coin? Why do you say I have to have a pile of coin? First of all, an epistemic question. Would you know a pile of coin if it was staring you in the eyes in 1500? No. Secondly, why do you need it? Why are you going to put that over his eyes when you put the cloth over his face? No one's going to see the coins unless you're in the 20th century. So why go get the coins? Okay, if you want dirt on the feet, rub some dirt on the guy's feet. Why go to Palestine to get limestone from Jerusalem? Nobody cares. Nobody can see it. And nobody could test it. But it's there. All right, now I don't have a whole lot of comments about the next few pictures. These are just some of the setup and what it looked like. That table was, is the size of the, the shroud. It was behind John Jackson in that first picture. And you might think this, you go, what is this, infrared? 
It's actually ultraviolet photos being taken. Here's more work being done up, up, up and back on the shroud and, there, and the data is being computed there and can be studied later. These next two photos are not, not the color of the shroud. These are enhanced photos where everything the same density as blood shows up red. The same chemical density as blood. And it looks like that first picture, only this is red and the first picture was brown. But you see the, the number three shaped uh, blood stain. The hair, uh, the blood in the eyebrows. The, the hair down the nose. He's got large contusions on both cheeks, like a, a, like a heavyweight boxer. By the way, the man in the shroud is uh, pretty large for his time, 5'10", about 180 pounds. And uh, you have more pictures later, but he's in good shape. It's good definition between the chest and so on. He's in good shape, but there's a lot of blood in this picture. And do you see now why the beard, that's not the bottom of the beard, that little U-shaped, see where the beard goes all the way down below? But the painter thought that was the shortness of it, and then you see the blood filling that wrinkle in the um, cloth. Here's another one, same, a different way with the same uh, density as blood showing up red. Look at the side wound there. On the right-hand side, the chief pathologist, MD, um, Robert Buckland, he's assistant, he was a, uh, assistant county coroner in L.A. County, MD in pathology. He also has a J.D. in law. That's interesting. But he, uh, he told all of us, and, and everybody, uh, people see it. He's not the only one. But he was the chief pathologist on the team, a bunch of pathologists. And he said, there's not just a blood flow. There's a distinct watery flow. So we're back to the pericardium slash uh, what's called pleural effusion with the blood and the pushing up on the lungs and it causes death just as surely as. Um, I'm for, who, who had the operation on the, okay. Why don't you tell them what happened to your pericardium when you were having, what was it, a massive heart attack? No, it was just heart surgery, right? I had seven bypasses. Seven bypasses. Now go ahead and tell them what they found about your pericardium. And uh, finally, the doctors called in the surgeons again, and they took me and put a tube in the back and drew three liters of the reddish water out. And I watched them do it. Three liters out of his pericardium, the sac that surrounds the heart. That's one and a half two-liter bottles into something that usually only has a few cc's. But that's an example of what happens. It was, remember I told you during a lot of stress, the thing can expand and make more after seven bypasses. And this happened a few days later. He said, I felt like someone's sitting on my chest. I said, I've got asthma. I always feel like someone's sitting on my chest when I have asthma. That's kind of how it feels. But to take three liters of this liquid uh, off his chest, uh, sorry, yeah, three liters from a seven... Bypass. I thought put that in there after after I talked the other day. That really says something. And Bob Buckland says, "Yeah, there's a water mix." And I'm going to show you a bit, just slightly later here. Some the blood flows down and it goes across the waist in the back. Presumably, when they take the guy down and they turn him sideways, the blood goes from here down across the waist this way. One objection. A lot of people at this point say, uh, "Excuse me, this guy's supposed to be dead, right? Yeah. Well, dead bodies don't bleed." First of all, uh, so many of these guys who do it are pathologists, and they go, that's a total myth. They said, if you want to come work with me for a day in the morgue, we move bodies, you'll see blood. It still flows. But this is different, because if this guy has two liters, one liter, 12 ounces, it is pericardium, dead bodies may not bleed very much. Jars don't bleed either. But if you put a hole in the jar, the liquid's going somewhere, Right? If there's liquid built up in you, it's going to go somewhere. And they take him down, they tip him sideways, and it rolls across his waist. Bob Buckland said the watery solution is visible in the front, but it's way more visible along the back, the blood flow in the back, which you'll see. 
my co-author, Ken Stevenson, there's a series of these are called photo micrographs. He says these, these are his favorite photos. And I used to kind of say this in a mystical way, and I quit doing it because people were taking it too seriously. Steve, it's almost like your objection about NDEs and misleading people, if you're not careful. So I'll just state it as a fact and not try to get mystical. If this is Jesus, if you're looking at one of Jesus' actual bloodstains, and what does that say about our theology? I'll just say right there. But I would say things like, folks, can you imagine? Maybe look at the blood of Jesus, and people are like, Oh, man, never thought about that. We don't know it's Jesus, I know, but just the thought is like blowing my mind. You know, that's the way everybody's acting, so I quit saying it. The, the, um, the red is blood, and it goes all the way through. The image, look at these image. You see this shiny right here? Those are image threads. You see how superficial it is? It's right on top. The image does not go through. The scientists, and they had everything, chemists, physicists, medical doctors, pathologists, uh, 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 all sorts of electrical engineering, those t- sorts of engineering. Uh, like I said, that team consisted of 35 uh, specialists when they went over there. And they started saying, we don't know anything like this. We don't know anything physical where the blood goes through, the image is superficial on the top of a thread, the first few fibrils. You see, that's a thread that's on, but it's just a fibril sticking up off the thread. It's an image thread. All right, until just recently, this next few photos are the number one mystery to be explained on the shroud. I mean, so far you're going, why is this thing superficial? No answer. I didn't tell you another one. I don't have it here. It's in my one of our shroud books, which I don't I didn't bring, but um, the image is also non-directional. Now we have a photo of non-directionality in one of our books. Here's non-directionality. When you photograph the image, the, the energy on the cloth, it looks just like you took a lampshade off and photographed the bulb, all the light, you don't where well, you don't see the bulb, but all the lights out and it looks like a mini sun in your living room, you know? And that's non-directionality. What does that mean? That means nothing was applied to the cloth where they had to do direct, this is directionality, your coloring. And yes, I'm left-handed. And then you get tired and you do this. That's directionality. There's no directionality on the shroud. The shroud image went on like this. So just... If they say, put that in your pipe and smoke it. So we got non-directionality, superficiality, and here's number one. The guys in the Air Force Academy had a, um, a really advanced contraption that there are only a few working now in the world there because they're outdated by other things. But they use for space shots. So you can get distance from the spaceship to, say, Mars. You could do distance. And they took photos of the shroud... And they put them in a machine called the VP8 image analyzer. And all of a sudden, when the picture came out, boom, this guy's looking at him. Now, the face appears to be lifted above the cloth. It's just a photograph. But the photograph encodes this data. So it's an image. And you notice some of the same characteristics. See where the wrinkle's going across the cloth? And see how far the beard goes down? But the guys in the painting do it just below, just about like where mine is. They start it right here. It's really going down here. Okay, by the way, another little mystery. Someone said, we'll say, we'll say, yeah, but they put the face cloth over Jesus' face. And I, I'm not saying it's Jesus, but they put a face cloth over his face. Why would the image be in the cloth? Shouldn't it be in the face cloth? Well, they had a guy on the team, or he came just afterwards when they're doing the data, And he was a very famous liberal New Testament scholar. In fact, this is not a good illustration, but he was called a God is dead theologian in the 60s. Let's just say he's not conservative. He wrote a famous 60s um, rant against religion called Honest to God. And the book basically says everything Christianity is a myth. 
John A.T. Robinson, not to be confused with the Greek scholar I mentioned earlier, the Southern Baptist, A.T. Robertson. This is John A.T. Robinson. He's on the committee, and they're going, where's this face cloth? We need a New Testament guy, Dr. Robinson. He's at Professor Cambridge. He was. He's passed away. Um, Come on over and help us. So he does some work. And the face cloth is only mentioned two places in the scripture, Lazarus, John 11, Jesus, John 20. Face cloth. Now, he's th- in both places, it says wrapped up and put around the head, the face. One of them says wrapped up around the head, the other one says wrapped up around the face. And he said, I think the Greek means this. It's like the old cartoons um, or Three Stooges. When you have a toothache, you put a cloth around and tie it on top. Remember that? The old thing. He said, if it's a face cloth you put around the face, you do this with it and tie it up. Lo and behold, the Mishnah, Jewish commentary, uh, requires that the jaw be bound up when they're putting bodies in tombs because the jaw pops open, usually, often, um, and they had you tie the jaws. And he says, well, that's a Jewish custom. That's on our side. The Greek is on our side because wrapped up, put around the head. And look at this picture of Jesus. Purported. I'm not, I'm not there myself. But look on the two sides of his face. You see the cavern in between the hair and the cheeks? You can't see what's holding. You'll, you'll see it better here in a couple photos. But the hair comes out like this, and it stops in space. It's like, wow, they used a lot of hairspray. No, I mean, I'm being silly. Blood can do that, right, when the blood dries. But the hair comes out, and it's hanging here like this. But there seems to be a cloth in there. Let me ask you another question. Why is the little part of the beard that the painter thought was the whole beard, why is it out front and the rest here, it's pulled back against his throat? That's why it looks different. Something's there between the hair and the face and this and the hair and the cloth, the beard goes back here. So that's what it looks like. Whoever he is, it's Jewish custom, it's Greek, the New Testament, it looks like a face cloth, that kind. All right, back to the 3D. This green picture is not the picture of it, but this one gets a lot of publicity. It shows up in a lot of newspapers, a lot of magazines. I don't know. I never, nobody's told me why it's green, but there's a different image of the 3, 3 AD. Okay, I called Ken. I just finished my doctoral dissertation at Michigan State, 76. They got back from the test in 78. I wanted to see if the shroud had anything for the resurrection. That was my dissertation. I called Eric Jumper, the guy who's separating the stuff, and he didn't want to talk to me. He talked to me a little bit, but he said, you know, I really can't talk to you. He said, we've signed a silent statement and we can't release comments to the press until we get the science out. And uh, we had about a year to go before it was to be revealed. He goes, but our editor will talk to you, Ken Stevenson. All right, great. Would you give me Ken's number? Yep, it's right here. I called Ken about 11 o'clock that first night. He was in, I was in Detroit. He lived in New Orleans because he left the Air Force and he was a Learjet pilot. He was a B-52 bomber pilot of Vietnam. And uh, second youngest B-52 bomber pilot. He's got some fantastic stories as far as miracles happening. But so he said, we started talking at 11 o'clock, never talked to the guy before. We were still talking at 3 o'clock in the morning. And uh, that's typical for me. I don't go to bed till 2, 2.30, maybe 3, normal time for me. But Ken kept talking, too. And at the end of the phone call, Ken goes, well, I got to tell you this part, too. I started saying, is there any evidence here for the resurrection? He says, you're taping this, right? I said, yep. He goes, turn your tape recorder off. It's in the tape. Turn your tape recorder off. Click. Don't know what he's saying. He's telling me some things here that point to resurrection. Go back. All right, Ken, recorder's going back on. Yep, I got you. Boom. Hey, Ken, I got another question about the resurrection. Turn your tape recorder off. He does that about three or four times. And so he told me this stuff, but it's, I don't have it taped. And uh, so at the end of the phone call, he doesn't know me from Adam, right? Oh, when Eric Jumper said, he said, we don't talk to reporters. I said, I'm not a reporter. He goes, you sound like a reporter. Ask my wife. That's because I ask a whole lot of questions about a whole lot of things. That's philosophy. You know what you know about philosophers? 
They ask a lot of questions. They have very few answers. <laughs> so he says, you sound like a reporter. I said, Eric, I just finished my PhD at Michigan State. I can send you my credentials. Well, I don't care. I don't care who you are. I can't talk to you. You just sound like a reporter. You're making me nervous. He goes, call Ken. So I did. At the end of the phone call, Ken says, hey, do you want to write a book together on the shroud? <laughs> First phone call, four-hour conversation. Do you want to write a book? Wow, Ken, this will put me on the bottom floor. You're the man. You're the editor. You're the spoke. Yes. So we both wrote our halves of the book. I used my outline. I would set it all up. He wrote half. I wrote half. I flew down to New Orleans to be with him. And when I walked into his house, this is the third three-day picture. This is a whole body image, six feet tall. And it's, that's his drapes, his golden drapes there in the uh, living room. And this, this is not like some kind of image or something. This is the VP8 readout move from the photo to cardboard. It's a cardboard cutout of the VP8 in, image analyzer. Notice, this is just an odd thing. Notice right here, it seems like there's a break in the nose. It's commonly believed that the, the nose is broken. Now remember, the nose is out of bone, for those of you thinking about that. Up here it's a bone, down here it's cartilage. Um, and also, they're not sure about it. There, it could be an abnormality in the VP8 image analyzer, how the, the thing comes out, the reading. Also, they think one of the blows ripped Jesus' lip. You know, you think about the passion of the Christ. Ripped his lip up to his nose. I mean, it was really brutal how they beat him. You're going to see a picture of that in a moment. But this is a VP8 image. This is a 3D. And um, what does it show? It shows that there's cloth to body distance. On the, here, here's what it means. The man's lying on his back. The sheet's over top. The sheet is going to touch the high points on the body. The forehead, the nose, the chin, definitely not the throat, especially if you have a beard. Not the throat. It's going to touch the chest. It's not going to do the rib cage. And to make matters worse, the body is in a state of rigor mortis. About six reasons you can't question this guy's death. He, he's got separation of blood and serum, postmortem blood flow, and uh, these are the pathologists. And the, the left knee has popped back up in its pre-crucifixion position like this. So you think the cloth is going to go over the right knee, but it's not going to go on the left knee, but it's not going to go on the right knee. It's down below. But there's no difference between the image on the left knee and the image on the right knee. It's all equally represented. Here's another oddity. You folks tell me, where's the image going to be darker? Where it's simply lying across the front or underneath his back on whatever it is the body's lying on? Where's the image darker? Where? they are the same density. So now whatever makes the image has to be some other kind of thing, not weight dependent, not paint dependent, not things being put on, except for the blood. The blood was put on and soaked through. Um, but they're getting all these mysteries and they're going, you can't have two images equal with one with 180 pounds on it and one of them laying on top of the 180 pounds. And what about the, the um, pollen? And what about the limestone? And what about, and what about, and what about? The image over the eye. What about? Then they did the carbon-14, everything goes, and today the carbon-14 is thrown out. A lot of people don't know about it, but anybody knows about the statistics deal published in the uh, Oxford Journal thinks it's done. And Raymond Rogers' thing on you, te you tested the wrong cloth is very important too. All right, I've got a few more slides. 3D was the tip... Um, what the 3D image says is the body touched, the, the image is like everything's equal. All the image, not just the front and the top and the back. The, you can see the rib cage. You can see the right knee. You can see the throat. You can see the parts that didn't touch. So whatever created this image went through space. So see people start saying, well, let's talk about a vapor graph. Maybe some kind of chemical Gave them up there. They tested all kinds of chemical things, and all they do is leave smudges on the cloth. They don't leave clear. There's nothing like this in history. There are hundreds of burial garments 
none of them with images. Blood and decomposition. That's all that's on burial cloths, if there's anything. Um, this one's got blood. No decomposition. That's another thing on the shroud. Raymond Buckler, the, the chief uh, pathologist, no body decomposition. All right, this is a model on the left of a Roman flagrum with which they did the damage. And this particular kind modeled after the shroud, the marks on the shroud, as you'll be able to see, in fact, here's a, on the right is a drawing. On the left is an actual back wound. That's where they get the idea is that these are dumbbell-shaped pieces of lead. They often did that, and get this, back to Passion of the Christ, they often sharpened the edge of the dumbbells so that it would gouge out human flesh on contact. And here's an actual photo of the back. Look at the carnage on the back. But look at the one on the right more than the one on the left, because the one on the right is a larger picture. By the way, see the blood stain across the waist? We talked about it earlier. That's from the heart. On the uh, left is more, more compact. And see how thick and how many the, the whipping marks are? Um, um, by the way, he either has carried a heavy object or he's rubbed up against a heavy object or both because, you can all see this without my help, but the scapular region on the upper back, here and here, all the blood is marred, it's rubbed. So the, so the heavy object comes after the beating and it's either from carrying or rubbing up against. So you're just putting all these puzzle pieces together and um, let's look at the bottom right-hand one there. That's the legs and the feet. This man's been whipped on every ounce of his body except for his face, his hands, and his feet. Everything else has been whipped. And those whipped down below are thighs, and look at the calves at the very bottom. Do you see the whip marks going different directions like this? One will go like this, the next one goes like this. Guess what the pathologist concluded? At least two men are doing the whipping, one of them significantly taller than the other one, and one of them is left-handed. They can tell that from this kind of stuff back in 78 and afterwards. Here's the four wounds mostly connected with, with uh, crucifixion. And you can see um, the left foot looks like it's crossed over the right. You know why? The body's in a state of rigor mortis, and here's how the feet are shaped. That's how they are, like that. That's why the left knee is up. The body in rigor mortis is returned, or has, still has some up. Rigor mortis doesn't stay, right? Rigor mortis comes on, and in a number of hours it leaves, but there, it looks like there's still some, some of that here with the left foot going over and um, the left knee going up. And, uh, well, I'm, I may have gone too far to show you this one, but his head is frozen in a forward position like this. So even when they lie him down on his back, his head is forward, like you'd be if you were hanging and you're down. You see where the, the spike, the nail is placed on the lower left-hand corner there? They have to put it there, they think, in order to hold the weight of the human body. Romans know what you're doing. You feel your, your wrist and you can do that. There is one exception. A well-trained MD, pathologist, who has, also has a PhD in anatomy, he thinks the nails were placed here, but they nailed them such that they came out at the wrist to avoid that ripping out question. Maybe. No one agrees with them, but, I mean, it's possible. It's right at the base of the palm. Oh, you know how you can find out where he thinks? Take your hand and put the thumb against the little finger, and that's called dust dot space, right here. He thinks the nail was placed at the end of that furrow right there. And it came out here. Because it's plainly, well, I haven't showed it to you yet. But the next slide, the, the, the wound is plainly coming out of the wrist and the back. And here it is. There's the left wrist. And blood is flowing up the left side from that hole. 
Now the right side, the, the wrist is covered. You can't see the hole in the left wrist, but the blood, as you can see, is equally going up the... And remember I told you in crucifixion, you move up and down to breathe? The blood is at it's 10 or 15 degree angles. The blood flow is different when you change the size of your body. So, I mean, you can tell the guy's crucified, but that's just another reason to think he's crucified. Here's an artist drawing on where the spear entered the chest. The estimate from the, from the anatomical, from the pathologist, is that it entered between the fifth and the sixth ribs through the thoracic cavity into the heart. Now, they don't even draw the pericardium. It's so, it's so you know, thin around, but that liquid is in the pericardium. And after death, again, dead men don't bleed. After death, the blood is often stored, well, it's stored in the right oracle. If you're going to stab, you stab the usually uh, right side makes sense, even if you don't know anatomy, the Roman soldiers. And so it looks like the blood and water comes from either the lung, if he had pleural effusion. Most people think it's not, it not, there's not pleural effusion here. Could be, and you're dead. But the spear goes into the heart, and you're dead. So there's a lot of reason to know this guy is dead. And here's the actual chest wound right here. And hard to see because there's a nice little nun's patch right there on the edge of it. Okay, here's another. Okay, now last thing. I've kept you too long. Um, I do this with crowds. When we're over, when we're over time, I'll go. A anybody who has to leave, just go, and nobody gets up. I mean, it's, it's just too captivating, right? Pardon? It's captivating. It is. I, I remember I told you last night, no matter who you think it is, it'll change your thinking about this. All right. Here's the big one that has surpassed 3D. Here's the odd things. Uh, superficiality, only on the surface. They don't know anything that can do that. Non-directionality, something like a but no application. A 3D image, which is not on any piece of cloth we have, can't be duplicated. Well, then they started seeing this. You know, his fingers look awfully long. They said this at the beginning. And somebody would say, well, he might have Marfan syndrome, which is what Abraham Lincoln had. It's where you have digits that are oversized and parts of the body are exaggerated on length. No big deal, but he could have Marfan syndrome, they said. And that's why you can see these fingers. Okay, one medical doctor from Duke, Duke University, um, he's got a dual certification in psychiatry, interestingly enough, and in, um, it's this x-ray stuff. He's got a, a second certification, and he's a professor. He just died recently, he and his wife. Um, he's the one that does the overlay of the photographs. His name's Alan Wanger. His, his, he and his wife wrote a really good book on the shroud. And, um, oh, his second one is surgery. So he does a lot of work on everything. And he did, took these photos. And what he did was he took a, a photo of the back of the human hand and put it next to the man in the shroud, and his argument is, back to the non-directionality, something went like this, and it's on the cloth. He said, that looks like what it's seen, because the reason these fingers are long, it's not Marfan syndrome. You're seeing the bone structure all the way up into the hand. You're, just feel it with your own hand. You're, you're, the bones go right up there. And he says, you're seeing the structure, the fingers look long, because you're seeing the whole thing. But here's the question, how can you see the whole thing? How can you see into the skin above the hands? Okay, we'll solve that in a second, or give the best answer. Here's the shroud face again. I was showing this slide, it's happened to me more than once, but there was a doctor in the room, and one time the doctor was in the front row, and the slide was like here, and I went to flip it, and he goes, whoa, 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 stop. And I stopped, and he said, I'd been giving lectures on the shroud for a long time by this time, and he said, look, look at this photo. Look underneath his lip. Those are teeth. Now, it's not because somebody blew his lip up or he's bleeding. He's not opened up there. 
but there, you're seeing the teeth through the skin. So you say, okay, wait a minute. We're seeing the fingers where we can't see fingers up in here. You're seeing teeth through the cloth. And I don't have a photo of this, but a lot of people think you can see the back, you can see the backbone through the top of the image. So you can see the outline of the back, even though you have to look all the way through a human body to see it. But the hands, that's pretty interesting on whatever caused the image. Look at the face, look for those teeth. And so the, the doctor from Duke, the surgeon, it's a picture of his face. He forgot to take his glasses off. This is the human skull. And he cut the picture in half and put the, the x-ray of the skull up against the, the proper proportions against the man in the face, uh, for the face of the man in the shroud. You see how the teeth come right across from the skeleton and it just makes like a perfect hole right across the shroud? Like, whoa, he looks like Skeletor or something. You know, he looks like a skeleton, and the teeth just go on continuing. Not just the teeth that you can see from the medical doctor up here, but this is the stuff you're seeing underneath, this lower deal, and that's what the doctor in the front row was pointing to. He did it with the naked eye. These are the teeth. And they're going, all right, non-directional. Superficial? Is it radiation? Who said that? I did. Is it radiation? Bingo. This thing has been tested over and over and over and over again, a variety of ways in universities, mostly Italian, um, like medical part of the, like Padua, University of Padua, or in places that have, and and they use a bunch of different techniques. It's not just x-rays. And... What they have decided is what you're looking at here is, there's that picture, and here's the last one. The leading view today, and the skeptics can't stand it. They'll think, do everything they can to refute this. But I'm not sure, I'm not sure it's Jesus anyway. So, I mean, I I don't have a horse in the race. I mean, I kind of do. I've written two books, but I'm not saying it's got to be Jesus. But here's what they don't like. You've got a dead man, six evidences that he's dead. You know, it's kind of hard to fake rigor mortis and separation of blood and serum and post-mortem blood flow. Um, He's dead. He's been crucified. All these seem more than obvious. Things are on this cloth that are no other burial cloth, so we can't even duplicate the stuff today. And oh, no, what do you do with radiation coming from a dead body? In different tests, there's one test, there's two kinds of radiation coming out of the body. You know how you know it's coming out of the body? We first gave, when Ken and I were first giving our lectures, we, people would say, is the radio, if it's, if it's a ray of radiation, is it coming down or coming out? And we used to say, they haven't told that yet. Well, the same doctor who was sitting in the front row said, look at the teeth. He said, it's obvious which way the radiation is going. It's coming out. Because if it weren't coming out, the teeth were in the back wouldn't be on the front the teeth wouldn't have come out. So whatever's happening is inside the body. And the first person, before they started running tests, the first person to do this was a chemist at Eastern Michigan University. And he said, this is radiation. He said, I've worked all my life with radiation burns and so on, that's my area, and this is radiation. And they said, well, how did radiation come from a dead body? Because, you know, dead men don't do much. How's our radiation here? And he said, well, (laughs) he said, he could have lived in a radioactive cave. He said, I mean, that's possible, but he said he wouldn't live very long. This kind of radiation would kill you. So he could have eaten radioactive vegetation from the ground. That would have killed him too. (laughs) He wouldn't have gotten to the cross. He goes, and then he said this, first time this broke in the news, it looks like radiation. He said, But any other answer I can give starts sounding mystical and makes me sound like a theologian, so I'm not going to answer any further. His name was Giles Carter. 
Chemist University of Michigan, uh, Eastern Michigan University. The leading theory today is that the image on the shroud is radiation from a dead body. Now, I'm not trying to blow this up or make it any worse. I mean, make it any more bombastic. But if it's Jesus, only God could have made this image where the man in the shroud is dead as a doornail, but it looks like he's coming alive. If he were alive, you know what they'd say? Swoon. Got down off the cross alive. You still couldn't explain half this stuff, but they'd say that. He was alive. No, he's dead. Then what's the radiation coming out? If it's this, the precise second is caught when dead, when dead, energized, not alive yet. It's, it's pretty exciting, but I can't prove that. I'm just saying uh, this thing is really extraordinary. More man hours than anything else. That's it. Study. Pardon? A live study. He's coming back alive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, re- it's really something. I think Steve was first. One more question. Um, what do we know of how the shroud got to Turin in the first place? Yeah, it's a big question. Uh, there's a sense in which, yeah, you want to know it. And Ian Wilson, an Oxford history major who later became a journalist, Ian Wilson did, wrote a famous book in 1978. I think it was 78. And you don't like my slides? <laughs> I'm just kidding. You go on. Hey, for all the educated people in here, that fellow has a PhD. So we've got a lot of people in this class. So he can leave. Um, so anyway, um, so, so when they're doing all these things and, and you're seeing these things and you think, I don't know, but this is like too good to be true. And it looks like just instantaneous. And like you kept seeing all the way through this, it really is something. Now, Steve, you were asking. Yeah. What, how, what do we know of how the shroud. Ah, that's right. That's right. Ian Wilson. He did a potential historical pilgrimage. There is an ancient, it's extra biblical and it's late. So you do with it what you want. But the shroud, the burial shroud of Jesus was taken by Thaddeus, the disciple, up to Turkey because King Abdar the fourth, fifth something, was dying and he wanted to touch the shroud to see if it would heal him. Now, this is all kind of a, everybody thinks it's a mythical, I mean, it's just really too old. But there's a story that the shroud was in Turkey. It was taken up to Turkey. And when the Muslims were destroying Christian artifacts, the, sh- the shroud was kept and was put in a wall of a castle where it was. they could put the stone over top of it and you couldn't get it unless you took the stones apart. And so the cloth was there for a few hundred years. So first of all, it doesn't have a lot of the damage that a cloth would have. Secondly, there are mummy cloths that are much long older than the shroud. And they didn't, you know, some people say, that thing should have fallen apart by now. But the mummy cloths are even older, way older. And uh, so Wilson thinks it went from Israel to um, Turkey, and it was taken during the Middle Ages by the Knights Templar. There's a story about this. You can find it. Knights Templar were priests who fought. They would be like, um, without the weapons, they'd be like priests with black belts, they went into. They went, went over and went to the Crusades, fought swords, everything. They were good soldiers. They were also priests, called Knights Templar. And they think they brought it back to Eastern Europe, where it's been in France and um, mostly northwestern Italy. Moved out to the mountains during World War II, so it wouldn't be bombed. Um, but that's roughly the history. The other side of me says this, Steve. Who cares? If if it's an ancient artifact that has dirt from Jerusalem, plants from Jerusalem that are prehistoric, um, coins of Pontius Pilate. We may not know how it's there, but it seems to have been there at some time and then say, but that's aside. The main point is the science and what do you do with all the science? So that you might set aside the geography a little bit, but that book by Ian Wilson's a good one. You can get it used, The Shroud of Turin. 
And there's a map in the back on the inside cover of the pilgrimage up there. And, and his, his view has pretty well been adopted. But get this, he ends his book like this, this Oxford guy. He ends his book and he says, if the shroud, even back then they were saying it could be radiation, 78. He said, if this is what it purports to be, the shroud could be a photograph of the resurrection of Jesus. Photograph in the sense that an x-ray of a broken leg is a photograph, right? It could be a photograph of the resurrection, and he ends his book like that. Just with these, you know, again, I say photograph in the sense of, of, uh, of x-rays. Was there, okay, go ahead. Well, I was just thinking how um, laminin is in every cell of the body, I think we've heard, and it's the shape of a cross that um, helps us all think of Christ. And as you just said of the resurrection, I thought when the Lord breathes life into Adam, and also when egg and sperm meet, there's a spark of light. So when the Lord God brings Jesus back to light... Um, in him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. And then verse 9 in John 1, there was the true light. Well, first 7, and then John speak. He came for a witness that he might bear witness of the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came that he might bear witness of the light. There was the true light, which comes into the world and lightens every man. And I was just thinking there was probably a spark of light, his whole body, when he rose through the material. Through the cloth, like through the stone of the tomb. Through the cloth, through the stone. Praise the Lord. (laughs) And left the cloth behind in the tomb. He didn't need it. For us to see and research. Yeah, it just laid there nice and still. Because he just Yeah, Ken and I were going to do a chapter in our second shroud book on light in the Bible. And then we thought, ah, this is getting too bombastic. So we left the chapter out. But you're right. There's a lot of light references. And again, the angels at the tomb, but not Jesus' appearance. At least we're not told. So, and I tell you, they could have, the light could have been with Jesus' appearances. Remember, there could be five women and only two there. There could have been light with his appearances, but none of the accounts say that. Yes. So if the carbon-14 dating was a bad sample, why don't they do it again? Uh, they've tried to do it several times, and here's the church's response. You scientists should never get it right the first time. You want it the next time. Every time takes a patch. You're going to come back in five more years and want it again. You're going to take up five more years and want it again. We want this thing to be done. But this, and then here's the scientist's response. You can never do science and be done. It's always probable, and you have to do more. And when we discover more means, we'll need another piece. And they said, forget it. However... There are groups of scientists that are making some proposals right now that would do almost nothing to the cloth. The cloth can be carbon dated without being, not carbon dated, but it can be dated without being destroyed. And that's what some of these Italian labs did. The latest date says, um, it's definitely not what it was dated at, but the latest date, what they said was, is compatible with a first or second century thing. But it's also compatible with the 7th century thing, because it's a general thing. If you get it in the middle, there's plus or minus. And as a, as a philosopher, I don't like consistent with arguments. I don't like coherency arguments if they're your only argument. Because to me, this is what's coherent. Coherency means everything hangs together. Mormonism could be consistent, internally consistent. Hinduism could be internally. Everything can be internally consistent. I want to know which ones are true not which ones hang together well. You could come up with a pretty, you know, if you can make puzzles that hang together, you can make religions that hang together. So just to say the latest one says it's compatible with second century. I'll give you a better one. Um, When the guys, uh, I know I'm being taped, but I've said this in print. Um, They didn't want this stuff out. But 
it's been a long time ago, when they were taking the threads, and Raymond Rogers, who was the chief chemist, took the threads and said, these two threads are not the same. Don't argue with me, argue with science. These are microscopically not the right ones. You got, uh, here's the actual thread one, here's the junk you dated. They're not the same, you dated the wrong thing. Okay, just chemistry, not religion. Um, back when they were doing that stuff, they sent some threads to a very well-known university here in this country that has dating capabilities. And they took two samples from the cloth and sent them secretly. They had no permission to do this. They just couldn't resist. And they sent the threads and they got the dates back from this, this dating. This was about 82. And the dates came back, I think it was um, third century AD and first century AD. And then the guy who did the dating said, uh, I had a problem with your third century sample. They said, what? They said, there's a bacteria, which they know now, that's another thing that causes the date to go awry. There's a bacteria on the shroud that comes from, it's well known in, in like burial and things like that, and it's, it forms around things. And he said, I couldn't cleanse the third century sample. I couldn't get the stuff off. The other one is better, and it was either first or second century. So I went up to one of the stirrup guys. Stirrup is the testing, the group that went in 78. And I said, um, I heard you got a date from first or second century. They said, who told you that? I could have said Ken, but Ken and I were already in enough trouble breaking this thing, uh, this news. Uh, they were mad at us. And um, that's the least bit of it. But... They got up in the first shroud meeting after they were given the results and started screaming at us. And Ken's been one of their members for forever. And then Bob Buckland, the pathologist, defended us and some others defended us, but it was nasty. And so I don't want to tell them Ken did it. Uh, Ken gave it to me, but we also got a news deal that the, it broke. So we did it in our second book. And there's been other tests that have carbon dated the, the shroud plus or minus to like 250 years either side of 50 AD. I mean, yeah, 50 AD. So there are tests that can, that can do this. One other question. Is it possible to, to DNA test the blood stains? Yes, and they've already done it. Next question. <laughs> they, they blood typed it too. And, and I'm doing this, and doctor, um, what is the universal donor blood? What is it? I can't hear any of you guys. O positive? Somebody said to me, oh, so you tested this blood, yep. Wouldn't it be cool if it was universal donor? Wouldn't that be so cool for science and theology? But it wasn't. I think it was, uh, oh, I won't even guess. I, I've, I've been told, we've written it. It's one of the common, more common. A positive. A positive be one of those positive. I don't even know. It's not a big thing to me. And they did do DNA. But here's what they tell you. We did do DNA in the blood, but I'm going to tell you what, it's not the guy in the shroud. It can't be the guy in the shroud. Because they said, and they had DNA experts there at this convention I was at. They had pathologists. And they said, look, DNA is disturbed by everything. You touch something, you change DNA. How many painters have painted this? How many people have handled it? Thousands of people. So you're dating everybody's handling. Whatever it is, it's not the guy in the shroud. It's been messed up. It's been handled too much. So nobody trusts the DNA. Although a novel came out that turned the shroud into like some mega monster attacking the earth or something. And the DNA is the beast of Revelation 13 or something. It's just, I've got, well, I've got questions. Well, I guess, I hope I have answers, but I have a pile of questions. Um, Ramona, are you? Did we straighten that out about Peter? Okay, I got the question already. Second, do Muslims still believe in the swoon theory? I've heard them use it the most. Yep, they do. Um, but they're not New Testament scholars. So they're not in the scholarly category. They don't count as head count. 
And here's the big problem, the big historical problem with them using it. Um, the Quran is 600 years after the New Testament. They want to use the New Testament to, sorry, they want to use the Quran to trump the New Testament and say what really happened in history. But their book is 600 years late. That's not history. And so, yeah, they can say it all they want. And we would still have to give the refutations of the swoon theory, which I remember I did three yesterday, death by crucifixion, what's the spear wound of the David Strauss critique, which are knockouts. Um, so the historical thing is they, they say it because their book says it. First of all, some Muslims have been changing their view, including, I won't put anybody in the spot, but one of their major scholars... Um, Let's see, two of their majors, two scholars now have changed their view. But regardless, that is the major view, as this says, I hear this the most from them. Okay, so I'm not trying to be mean, but they're not specialists. They don't, you know, I'm not going to talk about Islam and tell you what it has to mean. Um, so there are other fields. But the worst thing is their book is 600 years late. I'm not trying to be mean, but that's just not history. Now, to show you that some of them know exactly what we're saying and agree, one of the first Muslims that started debating, he and Josh McDowell had a debate, famous debate, uh, years ago. And he wrote a book, the uh, Muslim uh, scholar wrote a book, and it's called Crucifixion. It's re really, it's really catchy. C-R-U-C-I-F-I-C-T-I-O-N crucifixion. And here's what he says. He said, when you talk to Christians and you tell them Jesus didn't die on the cross, they're going to say, yeah, but it's in the New Testament. It's clear. And our book is 600 years older than yours. That's not history. And he, he repeats it. And then he goes, and they are right about the Quran being too late. He says, they are right. And so whenever they say to me, your book is 600 years late, it's not historical. I say to them, got to be ready for this, look at all the contradictions in the Gospels, <laughs> which we've been talking about today and other times. The point is he tries to change the subject and goes to contradictions of the Gospel, with neither here nor there, because the so-called contradictions of the Gospel don't change anything. A person could admit, just for the sake of discussion, which I do not, I don't even do it for the sake of discussion, but a person could admit all the objections they want to bring up, it doesn't change any doctrine. And you know how you know? A lot of liberals who think the resurrection data are, are good, they all, it's unanimous they believe in contradictions. And none of them thinks it touches the, the um, resurrection data. So yeah, that would bother you if there were contradictions in the gospel. We're not admitting that. They're just saying there's, there's no challenge. But I just think it's interesting that that Muslim says, they're right. We're 600 years late. That's a little late for history. So why don't we talk about something else? And that's just a really interesting move. Um, can there be apostles today? Well, that's a spiritual gifts question. I'll, I, I would say that if there is a gift that is most likely not here today, I would say it's probably apostleship. Now, some people, some charismatics um, do this. Charismatic friends, okay? We're not talking debate and enemies, and that's, that's ridiculous. But they'll say, even the charismatics will say, apostleship is here today in a secondary sense. In the New Testament, apostles were first and foremost witnesses to the uh, ministry and especially the resurrection of Jesus, which they're no more alive. And secondly, they were church planters. And they'll say, some people have the secondary gift of apostleship today in the sense of uh, missionaries, perhaps, who specialize in church planting. And uh, I have no problem with that. But in the primary definition of walking with Christ and resurrection, I mean, you've got to say those times have passed. At least I think so. Um, can you talk about uh, how sin, pride, and selfishness oftentimes are reasons for people not turning to Christ, regardless of the evidence? I say, yes, 100% true. And that's why I started the first day and said, I have that objection that I call the Christians can be jerks ob objection. Uh, we hurt the gospel regularly. I mean, we probably all have done it at some time and it's, it should be repented of. Um, 
So we're going to have to, we have to be more careful of slandering Christ than we are of slandering ourselves. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll defend ourselves oftentimes at all, at all costs. And we should be, first and foremost, careful uh, not to portray these things. Because people do, the, the ones who deconstruct and the ones who are nuns today, they frequently, maybe the most popular thing they cite is Christians who live, um, you know, lives that are incommensurate with the New Testament. I don't know why that should bother them because Christians are human beings, we're sinners, and Christians can be jerks. But it does bother a lot of them and they leave for that reason, especially when they see it in the church. So definitely be careful. Okay, question about 1 Peter 3, 18 and 19. There's actually two of these passages in uh, Peter. Um, when did Jesus preach to the spirits and why? Remember the spirits in prison? Was it in view of their salvation? Were they the ones, uh, were they the ones who died in the flood in Noah's day? Yeah, there is a reference to that. Um, scholars are split on this. Some think the, you, you know, if you, if you go to a church that cites the Apostles' Creed, uh, by the way, it's not, it's not any rival of the 30s and 40s A.D. creeds. The Apostle Creed is often dated about 150 A.D. That's still pretty early. But some of the churches leave out the phrase descended into hell. They leave that out, and some leave it in. Um, I think it's for every denomination and church to uh, settle. I, it's, for, it's hard for me to get around it, but I know a really, really careful scholar Who's got who's dual trained in in theology and philosophy, and he thinks he can show a hundred percent from the Greek that this means through Noah in Noah's day, the second part of that question, and not going to to Hades at all. Now there is a reference there that the gospel was preached. Gospel is good news. And so if it is Jesus going down there, you wonder what he's doing. And A.T. Robertson, the famous Southern Baptist, one of the top Greek, the guy I told you a few days ago was probably the top Greek scholar in the world until Bruce Metzger came along at Princeton. Robertson taught at Southern Seminary in the 30s and 40s, and he's got a six-volume commentary of the Greek New Testament. It's, it's only the Greek he comments on. He's really, really good. And here's what he says about the passage in Peter. He says, if this was to offer them a chance of salvation... I don't see it in the Greek text. And if that's your verse for it, you've got very slim hope. That's his comment on the Greek. But it's a difficult passage and there's no, there's no one view on it. How about this one? Does a Christian who commits suicide go to heaven? Personally, I think it depends more on where their heart is with the Lord and only the Lord knows that. Some people can be um, very, very ill as in depression. And um, my own view, I, I think God is going to tell from the heart. Oh, I know he's going to. That's what scripture says. He's going to judge our heart. Remember, man looks on the outward appearance. God looks on the heart. Um, and I tend to think if the, rest of their, if the rest of their life is sold out to the Lord and they live, they've lived that way and they have weak moments because they're very, very depressed, and that's usually the cases. I usually think they're probably going to be okay, but I don't tell them that. See, because I deal with a lot of doubters, and I have doubters say to me, I would have committed suicide a long time ago, but I don't want to go to hell. I never correct them. So I don't want them committing suicide. And besides, why should this rely on my view? Oh, you'll be all right. I would never say that. I mean, you know, again, what I tell you the other day, I'm not the God of the universe and we're not called to separate the wheat from the tares. So I would never say that. I would have a tendency to think if everything else is fine, they're living for the Lord and loving the Lord and giving their heart to him, you know, but it is murder, right? And, um, but by the way, in the epistles where it says no one who murders or no one who sins is going to be in the kingdom, you go, sins? John says that. But John says, whoever commits their sin, he faithful and just or gives sin. A few verses later, he says that we shouldn't sin. But if we do sin, we have an advocate with the Father. So even John knows that. But if you get a, if you get a translation like this one that is good to the Greek, and the verbs in particular, 
where John says those things, the text means Christians don't continue to sin. Their life is not characterized by sin. And and because the same John says, if you sin, you have an advocate. Or one nine, faithful and just to forgive sins. So that's my view. It's very tentative. I don't have a view. I've never told anybody, you're okay, go ahead. You're really sick. Go ahead, do what you want. Um, But even when the doubter says, um, I would have done it before now. I don't want to go to hell. I go, well, that's a very serious question, which it totally is. And I just, I'd rather have them think there's a fair chance of that so that they don't take a chance either spiritually or physically. Now, Steve, we've got more than one Steve here, but Steve, is this from you? Okay. On, and this is good. I hate to get into it. This is a problem starting with NDEs, but uh, I did. So here's some questions. He talks about some possibilities here and there. Satan is an angel of light. God can do what he wants. You know, there's different views. Then he said, here's the questions. Well, I'll, I'll summarize a few of these. From NDE testimonies, could there be a false gospel of universalism? There can be. A lot of non-Christians have NDEs, and they're going to say, oh, yeah, I'm a Hindu, and I, yeah, I'm doing fine. That's their testimony. Of course, they're going to say that without the NDE, but it's more powerful with the NDE. And um, could this be Lucifer's ultimate deception to keep nominal Christians from heaven? Can an NDE be a subtle end around the gospel? And how would you segue from a, uh, NDEs into a gospel presentation? Okay, let me make several comments. I've said this several times, but I'm going to say it really, really, really clearly. I don't buy NDE testimonies as being authoritative. The heavenly accounts virtually never have any checks and balances. So I don't like the heaven accounts. I don't like the hell accounts. I don't even count, oh, wow, you better get straight because I know of hell accounts and then use the hell accounts and be inconsistent but not use the heaven accounts. You know, so I don't, there's just no, my, my criteria, my criterion is are there evidences and data for the cases I'm going to use? And I gave you three today, the sports car, the this is your father, the 12-digit number. They're a little hard to ignore, I do think Satan can be involved in Indies, especially with people who've messed around with the occult. And I've already said that today, that there are occult indications, let alone universal type ones. But let me say, those people are going to say that anyway. Their, their view was that they're fine being a Hindu. Of course they believe that. So they're going to keep saying it. But I think Steve's deeper question here is, could NDEs be a way that false teaching uh, comes in on the subject of the gospel? My response is this, uh, since I don't allow any, t- heavenly testimonies are, are fun to listen to, whatever, but I don't count them as data. So I would reject all of the, uh, this means everyone's going to heaven, or this means, and prognostication, Jesus has blue eyes. You know, I mean, you can hear all kinds of things. Um, I reject all of that, because I don't have any idea that they saw Jesus. They, I, I'll grant they thought they saw him, but... Um, I don't believe, I, I can't tell. Every ounce of it could be true. Every ounce of it could be false. Here's the catch, is that I don't have any reason to believe it's one or the other. I can't tell, because there's no evidence. But when I use it to segue into the resurrection, I never use the heaven uh, testimonies. I use the data on earth. I use the 12-digit number. I use, I could tell you some of them that are so... Some are just hilarious, but they're very evidential. I'll tell you what, we're doing this, I'll do one more with you. Uh, A lady went up for surgery, and her family, her father, her grandmother, and her two grandmothers were there. As soon as they took her up for surgery, they went down to eat in the uh, hospital kitchen. And she knows her grandmothers pretty well. She knows her dad. Her dad's a smoker. One grandmother used to be a smoker, but not now. The third one, anytime it's mentioned in the family, she's adamant. You'll never see one of those cancer sticks in my mouth. I'll never touch the thing. I've never had one before. It's never been between my lips. It will not be between my lips again. Don't even talk about this stuff. It's the devil's trick, you know. And that's the third, the second grandma, the third person. So she has an NDE. And often NDEers are attracted to where their family members are. I mean, I can tell you, one of them looked in on her family members in the waiting room and her brother in law her brother in law was pacing. Other family members were there. He was pacing. Look at his watch. 
He says, I've got an appointment. If she's going to kick the bucket, I hope she hurry up, hurries up and does it. <laughs> when she came to, she went, Bill, or whatever his name is, did you wish me kicking the... Well, uh, yeah. Now, what do you do with these? Now, back to the smokers. So she has this experience, and she goes to where her families are, and she sees the three of them. And they're all nervous, serious surgery, and uh, dad pushes away from the table. He says, I'm going to go out for a smoke. And the, aunt, the grandmother that used to smoke but hasn't smoked for many years says, do you have an extra cigarette? And he said, sure. The third one said, I need one too. <laughs> they went outside. She watched all three of them smoke. When she came to, she goes, Grandma, how is that cancer stick? And she was all sheepish and everything else. It was all true. It was all true, but it happened downstairs in our hospital at several floors away. And uh, they were outside smoking. And she reported the whole story, and she was correct. Just funny, you know, kind of cute. But she saw the grandmother who would never touch him, never did, smoking. But Steve, I, w- I would use the evidential earthly cases to show I only use NDEs to say there's an afterlife. And we do this in other subjects too. Um, there, are, there are examples of the other things I compared, arguments for God, um, uh, intelligent design, NDEs. These are natural revelation kind of questions that don't tell you which religion is right. But there are some negative sides on the proofs for God, and there's some negative things in ID too. We, we emphasize the ones that we think are scientific. That's the way we do the arguments. So I, I'm trying to do... What I'm doing is it's an opening to afterlife to which I switch to resurrection and go from them on. I don't cite the testimonies. And if they ever bring up, oh, the, um, their path to universalism, you're going to hear that whether you like NDs or not. They are, some of the people are going to, are going to say that. But um, I tell them, you don't have any data for that. The things you're citing does, is not provable by anything. So we can talk about that later if you want, Steve. Um, I don't have a problem. I have wrestled with that a lot. There's no question with NDs I've wrestled with more than this one. But I'm, I'm satisfied to use them as uh, evidence, the evidence ones, and go to the resurrection and deny the testimonies. I, I would deny the heavenly testimonies whether I was trying to give a gospel with them or not. They're just no evidence in my mind. Oh, one other thing I got to tell you guys. This is really cool. Do you notice my new glasses? Did anybody notice them? I did. They're not falling off your nose. Yeah, yeah. But see? Yeah. See? She said, they're not falling off your nose. People say to me, you know, your glasses hang pretty low on your nose. Greg Kokel, if you know him, apologist, last time I was with him, he said, dude, if you're not careful, that thing's going to go right off in about a quarter inch. Okay, now, I'm not sure Ron, there's Ron. Ron said, try this one on this morning back in the back room. It's not as, my glasses aren't very strong, they're over the counter reading glasses, but his were a little bit less, and I put them out there. I can read with them. He goes, I think I have a spare pair, and it's a little bit stronger than the one I have. Well, when he does it, Lee and my wife, Eileen, both go, wow. That makes you look more like a professor. (laughs) And Lee said, I don't know if she slipped, but Lee said, it makes your face look thinner or something like that. (laughs) Okay, it wasn't thinner. What would you say? Narrow. Oh, excuse me. It wasn't thinner. It was narrower. (laughs) Okay. So Ron came in tonight with a new pair. I put them on. Everybody liked them? Yes. This is the professor. The other one, the other one is right here. The one's falling off my nose. They'll go back on when I'm reading in private. You know, the crazy thing is he's got a lower uh, deal on it, and if anything, I can read it better. You saw I read all the questions with it. So, all right. We've still got almost an hour, so this is good.